All right, let's open our Bibles, if you have a Bible, to Luke chapter number 5. Lord, I would like to give something to encourage all of us in the Christian life. I believe a lot of times we make the Christian life a lot harder or complicated than the Lord intended. It's really simple when we think about it in respect to one of the most favorite apostles that we all we had Peter pray for the Now I want to preach, uh, but I'd like to preach on Simon Peter throughout his phases of his life because I think a lot of the things we experience, Simon Peter shows us as an example some of the things not to do. And I think we can learn from this. Luke chapter number 5, verse number 1. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night, and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net brake. They beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him, at the draught of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. Let's pray. Pastor Kim, will you pray and ask the Lord to bless the message, please? Father, we thank you for salvation through Jesus Christ. We thank you for this church we built up. Pastor Cash tribe, Pastor my tribe, and we work together. In which we can have a more local church like this mm -hmm. and glorify your name. Father, I pray we use Pastor Walker and our ministry get together and bring the gospel to the lost world. Father, I ask you fill with the Holy Spirit, Pastor Walker, so can, she can preach us what we need to them and charge us, challenge us so we can go out and Amen. And truly, when we think about our Christian life, we've been told so we can tell another. We've been given the gospel so we can give out the gospel to someone else. But as we think about Simon Peter, I want us to remember that as we go through a synopsis of Peter's life, there's one common thing that we're going to see through every stage of Peter's life. He got his eyes off of Jesus. I think that's pretty clear when we think about Simon Peter. And really the Christian life is real simple. We as believers in Jesus Christ must keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. We must stay focused on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just on the church. Not just on lost people. Not just on physical life. But on Jesus Christ. Christ our Savior. We've got to keep the main thing the main thing. And so when we think about Peter in this passage here, obviously this is when Peter's called. You know the story. Back in Matthew chapter 4, there's a partial surrender. The Bible speaks in Matthew chapter 4 about them forsaking their nets. Here in this passage, it's different. In this passage, we read about uh, experiment where they go off and they put out the, the nets, they bring in the fish, and there's more than just a partial surrender. Here we have a progressive surrender. Look with me in verse number 2. They're standing by. Okay? Verse number 2. Thrust out a little from the land. Those two ships are standing by. Verse 3, rather. Thrust out a little from the land. Then he says, launch out, verse number 4, into the deep. Then he says, let down your nets 
for a draw. There's a progression in our Christian life. But the whole time, we've got to keep our eyes on Jesus. Jesus never changes, but we change. And God brings us to each step of our Christian experience. And we are to progressively follow Jesus Christ. Progressively surrender parts of our life to Jesus Christ. He says, launch out. He says, let down. And after you let down, you've got to let go. A lot of times Christians have a problem letting go. We want to hold on to our life. We want to hold on to our plans. We want to hold on to our will, the things we want to do. God says, you got to let go. I'm in control. Years ago, there was a preacher, and he was preaching from the book of Genesis, where the Bible says, God created the heaven and the earth, and God said, let there be light. And he took a play on words with the word let. In other words, God said, let there be. So God said, let there be light. So he kind of flipped it around and said, you need to let God. And so the idea is to let God do things in your life. Instead of you trying to do it, let God do it. There was a student, he was struggling with this concept. So what he did is he took part of that that sermon there and he he made him a, uh, out of of wood, he wrote, wrote out the letters, let God. And he hung those letters up in his apartment. Let God. And he struggled with that. How Can he let God control his life? He was frustrated one day, and as he left his apartment, he slammed the door behind him and he went out. Well, little did he know, the word, the letter D fell off of that word, let God. When he came back in, instead of let God, it said, let go. And he realized, before I can let God do anything in my life, I've got to let go of my life. Surrender is giving up. Before you can gain, you have to lose. You've got to let go. And Peter learned that partial surrender wasn't good enough. There's progressive surrender. But then we have problematic surrender. It's hard to surrender. Notice in this passage, this is Jesus calling them. He's calling them, and Peter in particular, to follow Him. And whenever he shows Peter this great miracle, Peter is overcome with the fact of who Jesus is. I mean, they've been fishing all night. Peter knew the Sea of Galilee. James and John, Zebedee, they knew this sea. They knew the fishing industry. But Jesus said, just go try it one more time. Let down your net on this side of the boat. And they did what Jesus said. All of a sudden, all the fish came it hit Peter in the heart. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and he said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. The danger sometimes with our surrender is we get our eyes off Jesus when we go through a period of testing. Because that's what this is. This is a test to see if Peter is going to do what he tells them to do. Are you going to go back out even though you've been fishing all night? Are you going to do what I tell you to do? Are you going to launch out? Are you going to let go? It's a test. But oftentimes when we're tested, we get our eyes on self instead of the Savior. He said, depart from me for I'm a sinful man. I know you're a sinner and I'm a sinner. We are bad people. Can I get an amen? Don't look at me that way because I know we are bad people. You and you and you and you and you and me. But sometimes we condemn ourselves so much when God tests us and calls us, we don't keep our eyes on Jesus. If you're going to do anything for God, God's going to do it through you. He's not going to do it because of you. you got to let go. The danger is we get our eyes on ourselves. And we see this thing keeps going. And we see that we can't do it. A lot of Christians quit because of their own failures. A lot of Christians stop because of their failures and they don't realize God is faithful even when you fail. We see our sin, 
but we don't see God's solution. We see our problem, but we don't see His providence. We see our way, but we don't see His will. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Eyes on Jesus when He tests you. Eyes on Jesus instead of self. Turn over to Matthew 14. Let's look at Peter again. Matthew 14. You say, preacher, the Christian life, is it really that simple? It's that simple, but it is kind of difficult, isn't it? Matthew chapter number 14. Matthew chapter number 14. You know the passage very well, verses 20 through, through 36. This is when Jesus tells the disciples to go over on the other side of the lake. And when they do, you know the story. All of a sudden, the storm comes up. The storm arises. And they are in the middle of this bad storm. And then Jesus walks on the water. You know, God has a way in the storm. We have hurricanes where I'm from. We had one about 200 miles from us last year. We only had about 60 or 70 mile an hour wind. It wasn't all that bad. We lost power for, you know, a few hours. It wasn't too bad. But we have hurricanes. Y'all have earthquakes. I'd rather have a hurricane than an earthquake. If, if you're going to have an earthquake, give me a helicopter. So I can, I don't want to fall down into the earth. I got to thinking about that last night. I was like, I'm in this hotel. and this, If we have an earthquake, I'm going to get buried under all the rubble. At least it's a hurricane. You can prepare for it. You can run from it. You can, you know... You know, getting ready for it, but an earthquake, you know, just what do you do? Um, but God has His way in the storm. He reveals Himself in the storms. That's what He did with Job. Whirlwind. The Bible says He revealed Himself to Job in that whirlwind. He rebukes us in the storm. What did He do with Jonah? Jonah's in the storm. God rebukes Jonah in the storm. He reassures us. In the storm. That's what he does to the Apostle Paul in Acts 27. He's in the storm and God comes to him and says, It's going to be okay, Paul. And Paul says, Be of good cheer. I believe God. It should be even as it was told me. He reassures us in the storm. Here in Matthew 14, he rescues us in the storm. And this is what happens here. When you get into trouble, the storms are going to come. We go through a period of testing. We've got to keep our eyes on Jesus. We go through trouble. You've got to keep your eyes on Jesus. Now, I like the fact that Jesus told Peter to come out on the shore. And I think that it's kind of like this. I think Peter's in the boat, and he pulls his legs over and puts his, his legs down in the water, and there's nothing solid there. I think it's only when Peter finally lets go that he rises up. And he gets completely out of that boat. Then he's able to walk. But the funny thing to me about this story is that Peter... The storm is just as bad when he gets out of the boat as when he sinks. The storm was bad at the beginning. The problem is he gets out there and he gets his eyes off Jesus and gets it on the storm. And it's easy for us to do when we go through a storm. You know, his first focus was conviction. He saw Jesus and said, can I come out there? I don't care what the storm is. I want to be closer to Jesus. I don't care how bad the storm is, Lord. I want to walk out there to you. Outside of Jesus Christ, Peter is the only man that ever walked on water. I know we make fun of Peter and we preach against him and ridicule him, but he did more than we ever did. <laughs> His first focus is out of conviction. But then he gets his eyes off Jesus. I think we need more than just the first focus. You know, when you got saved and you got in the Bible, it didn't matter what happened to you. You could have a terrible time at work and you still had the joy, joy, joy down in your heart. You still were singing the songs, reading the Bible, coming to church, telling people about Jesus. You were focused on Christ. But we need more than just the first focus. We need a fixed focus. A fixed focus focus. Not just out of conviction, but out of continuance. You see, what I think happens, Peter got out there, and I don't know how long it was, but he's walking and going to Jesus, but it's not immediately that he sinks. 
there's a battering of the wind. There's a battering of the rain. It's a continual focus of Christ that we need. You see, we preach some with the young people about the devil, and the devil will let you have a victory here and there, but he will keep coming back. And the devil will keep battering you, and he'll let you have a Sunday here and now. You can blow a Sunday morning kiss at God, but the devil's going to watch you on Monday, and he's going to watch you on Tuesday, and he's going to watch you on Wednesday, and he'll keep coming over and over and over again. It's that constant battering of the trials. It's that constant battering of the storm where the wind doesn't stop and it just keeps raining and it keeps storming and the power goes out for hours and for days. That's what wears you out. The Bible says the devil tries to wear out the saints of the Most High. He might not can get you on one day or two days. Maybe he'll try it for three weeks or four weeks or a year, or a couple of years, he's not going to stop. You have to be real careful or you'll get your eyes on the storm, the trouble. So I'm doing pretty good. Yeah, you haven't been tested like so-and-so yet. You don't know what you would do depending on the circumstances. We better be real careful in this judgmental attitude. Well, I love God. No matter what happens, I keep my eyes on Jesus. I hope so. Peter thought he was just going to keep walking on water the rest of his life probably. (laughs) Time has a way of wearing us out, doesn't it? We have to have faith and confidence in Jesus Christ no matter what the outcome. Our faith in Him has to remain. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as so some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings that when His glory shall be revealed you may be glad also with exceeding joy. We are going to be tested. We are going to have trouble and we have to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. Not on self, Not on the storm. Turn over to Matthew 17. Matthew 17. Peter's life. Here we go again. Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. You know the passage. Verse number 1. After six days Jesus taketh Peter and James and John his brother. And bringeth them up into an high mountain apart. And was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun. And his raiment was white as the light. Behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. When the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. Thank God for the mountaintop. We had a great mountaintop camp this year. Every year it gets better. You can tell that some of the folks over here, their voices are shot out. I tried to tone it down a little this year. Last year, my voice was gone. So uh, we, I get excited, I'll just do like this. Instead of scream and hurt my voice, you know, I just kind of do this. Because, uh, you know, I wanted to be able to preach. But you have a mountaintop experience. God will give us not just a test, but He'll give us a triumph. We can have victories. And thank God for that. You say, why does He give you good experiences? Why does He give you a mountaintop? He gives you some leftovers. He gives you some experiences to encourage you in your Christian life. If you ever led somebody to Christ, man, what a great experience that is. To be able to lead somebody and say, do you want to receive Christ as your Savior? And they say, yes. And you pray with them and they ask Jesus Christ to save them. Man, that's a mountaintop experience. That encourages you to keep passing out tracts. That encourages you to tell other people about Jesus. That encourages you to invite people back to church. God gives us those mountaintop experiences. But the problem is, with Peter, just like with all of us, we get our eyes off of Jesus. And we get it on, maybe even, not just not just sinners, but we may even get it on the saints. Look what, Moses, look what Peter is looking at here. 
He says in verse number 4, let's make three tabernacles, one for thee, Moses, and Elias. He's looking at Moses and he's looking at Elijah instead of Jesus. Moses and Elijah are great. I can't wait to see them, but outside of Jesus Christ, I don't care nothing about seeing them. Moses and Elijah are nothing compared to Jesus. It's easy to get our eyes on the saints, the brethren. Thank God for good brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a blessing that you have a good church, that you have a great ministry. It's a blessing to fellowship. But all flesh is grass. We will disappoint you. We will fail each other. We will make mistakes. Jesus never makes mistakes. When you fellowship with other believers, what you need to see in them is the Lord, not that person. And so even though you might not get along with them and maybe you don't, um, your personalities aren't the same, you can still rejoice in what God is doing in their life. You can see Jesus in that person. Instead, we get our eyes on the saints. You'll notice the saints of the past, Moses and Elijah. You'll notice the sinners of the present. There's Peter, James, and John. Then you've got God the Father and Jesus Christ from eternity. You got the past represented, the present represented, and eternity represented. So, what about the past? I don't know. The Bible says Moses, my servant, is dead. That's what he told Joshua. Here's Joshua. He's all sad. He's all discouraged. He's thinking about the past. He's thinking about Moses. And God says, You need to bury Moses. Moses is dead and he's gone. You've got to continue now. You can't live in the past. When God gives triumph, we've got to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. You say, what does that produce? Verses 6 and 7, it produces worship. It produces worship. Notice whenever they worship Jesus Christ, verse number 7, He touches them. There's a firm touch. God will give you a firm touch. That's a cautioning hand. He knows how to get your attention. Puts His hand down on your shoulder. Hey. There's a fond touch. David said, Thy gentleness hath made me great. He can touch you in a caressing, in a caring way. And there's a fixing touch, a correcting touch. And he says, Hey, you need to listen to the, to the Lord here. You need to look at Jesus. See no man, but Jesus only. Why do we have mountaintop experiences? Why don't we go to the mountains anyway? You get up on the mountain, you can see down in the valley. When you get on the mountain, you can see, except for all the smog. I looked on my phone on the, uh, the weather, and under Ontario it says, very poor air quality. <laughs> what? Maybe I need to hold my breath while I'm here. Very poor air quality. But you get on top of the mountain, you say, what do you see? Smog. <laughs> But you get on top of the mountain, you can see more clearly. Sometimes you need a mountaintop experience because then you can see Jesus like you've never seen Him before. You see Him transfigured. You see Him illustrative. You see Him glorified. Instead of down in the valley, you get all the trouble and you get all the trials and you get all the testings and you're all confused. When you get on the mountain, you can see your direction. You can see God's will. You can see where you're going to go when you come down. You get clarity. John Glenn was a great astronaut. One of the first to orbit and to go in outer space. And he gave some advice to some young astronauts before they got on the rocket to go up, he said this, don't forget to look out the window. <laughs> don't forget to enjoy the view. God gives you a mountaintop for a reason. Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ and He'll give you clarity. Look over in Matthew chapter 26. Just a couple of more and we'll be through. I hope this is helping some. Our Christian life, just stay focused on Jesus. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Matthew chapter 26, 47. You know the passage? This is when Jesus Christ is betrayed by Judas. Matthew 
Verse number 50, Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Who do you think that was? <laughs> one guess. Simon Peter. Now the background of this goes way back to some things in Peter's life during the earthly ministry of Christ. Peter was a big talker. In other words, we recited the verse about a man that is hasty in his words. There's more hope of a fool than of him. Someone that's always talking, that means they're not listening. God gave you two ears and one mouth. You're supposed to listen twice as much as you talk. Peter was always talking. He was opening mouth and inserting foot. Okay? And so, Peter was not listening to Jesus. He was talking. And there's a background to what led up to this very point. He developed a habit of not listening. Therefore, he had preconceived convictions. Preconceived convictions. In Matthew 16, Jesus told him, I'm going to go to the cross. And Peter grabbed a hold of him and said, no. Peter could not conceive of the idea of Jesus dying on the cross. These people that assert that people in the Old Testament were looking forward to the cross, they don't have any brains. The disciples weren't even looking forward to the cross. I'll give you one even better than that. How could someone have been saved the same as we are, and even the disciples, you say, well, they're saved just like we were. They were just looking forward to the cross. We're looking back to the cross. Okay, listen to this. Well, Peter was saved, and all the people during the earthly ministry of Christ, they believed on Jesus, and they were saved the same way. How can you be saved when you don't believe in the resurrection? None of the disciples believed in the resurrection. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, you have to believe in your heart that God hath raised them from the dead. They didn't even believe in the resurrection. They weren't saved the same way. Peter had a preconceived conviction that Jesus didn't need a cross. He needed a crown. He was looking for the kingdom, not for the crucifixion. Preconceived conviction. Cross before crown. Preconceived conviction. Self before others. John 13, Jesus walks in the room and He grabs a towel and He begins to wash the disciples' feet. The others should have grabbed the towel and washed His feet. Or they should have grabbed a towel and washed each other's feet, but they didn't. You know, Peter made this statement. He said, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? He's trying to find out the absolute limit he can go to before he's got to serve others. Preconceived conviction. Another one is surrender before victory. We see it right here in the passage. He had victory before surrender. You have to have surrender before victory. It seems like a paradox, but it's interesting here. John's account is the only account that records the fact that it was Peter that tried to kill Malchus. And you say, why? Well, John was written about 96 A.D. Peter's already dead. I mean, it, that's written real late. Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written early. And so that was a pretty common thing. And I think as far as courtesy was concerned, they did not include the fact that it was Simon Peter who did that. Everybody knew it was. But Peter did not want to lay down the sword. When things get tough, there's a lot of background here. Preconceived convictions, painful criticisms. Matthew 16, you know what Jesus said to Peter? You are the devil. Matthew 16. When Peter took him and rebuked him, you know what he told him? He says, get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. He not only told Peter that he was the devil, but he told Peter later on at the Last Supper, he said, you will be a doubter. You're going to deny me, Peter. He told Peter that he would be a devil and he would deny him. And Peter says, no, I won't. 
These others might deny you. They're no good. I'm better than they are. They might do it, but not me. I will die for you, Lord. I will pull out the sword and fight for you. Didn't you tell me to go buy a sword? Yeah, you told us to buy a sword. Okay, I'm, I'm going to use it. By the way, I do have a firearm, and I live in Florida. I live in a place where you can. And uh, if I pull a gun on somebody, I'm going to use it. I'm not just going to pull a gun on somebody and not use it. I'm not trying to be mean, but I'm saying there's a gun by my bed. If somebody breaks in my house, I'm going to defend my house. Peter's like, I got a sword. I'm going to use it. You know, you can't judge where you are today. Where you, you can't judge where you will be later by you are, where you are today. Because when you get in that tough spot, it's easy to get your eyes on the sinners. Here's Jesus doing an amazing thing right here. Surrendering His will to the Father's will to be betrayed and crucified. Here He is at really the high point in Jesus' life. And Peter's not even listening to Jesus. He's not even looking at Jesus. He's just got his eyes on the sinners. And he doesn't want to save them. He wants to kill them. Some of it, you take the King James Bible and you swing it as a sword and you chop people's head off. The hardest part about this sword is the handle. You have to learn how to handle it and learn how to use it. It's a two-edged sword. And Peter's got his eyes on the sinners instead of the Savior. The likelihood of you or me denying Jesus Christ is in proportion to how much we keep our eyes on Him. If Peter had his eyes on Jesus, he would have been sensitive to Jesus' will and he would not have pulled the sword out and went to town. Turn over to John 21. This will be our last one. All through Peter's life, he gets his eyes off Jesus. You haven't ever done that, have you? John chapter 21. The passage is a great passage. This is when Jesus Christ appears to the, one of the last appearances here before His ascension. And Peter tells the guys in verse number 5, I'm going fishing. I don't know about you, but I'm going back to fishing. And they go with Him, and that night they don't catch anything. And then they see this man up on the shore, and he's got... He can smell the, they can smell the fish coming from off the shore. He's already cooking fish. He apparently has already caught a great catch of fish. He's cooking fish. And then he has the, the audacity to ask him, you caught anything? <laughs> Those of you who like to fish and do things like that, if you're ever out and you're fishing and you pass somebody, you normally ask him, you say, how, how have, you, have you done well? How have, you, how have you been doing? You know, where have you been catching them at? Have you caught any fish? And it's kind of embarrassing if you haven't caught anything. Like, well, you know, Oh, I just hadn't found anything yet. It's just not my day today. Well, you just might not know how to fish. <laughs> and so they had to admit, nope, we've been fishing all night. We hadn't caught anything. Well, Jesus draws them to Himself and He says, come and dine. I like the fact that our Lord is very merciful. When we mess up, He's willing to take us back. I appreciate His love that He has to us. And when you think about this passage, He restores Peter back to his discipleship. When Jesus was raised from the dead, a message was sent out to Peter that said, go tell His disciples and Peter. Almost like he had been kind of removed from being a disciple because of his denial. He had basically said, I'm not with these guys anymore. He basically said, I'm not following Jesus anymore. He got so upset, so mad, so put out with Jesus, he separated from the other group. And by the way, you need to be in church. You need to be with other disciples. You take one little piece of coal, one little piece of wood that's burning, and you pull it apart from the other pieces of wood, it will very quickly get real cold and the fire will go out. You keep that piece of wood with the other pieces of wood and they'll keep burning. You need the fellowship. And he sent word to Peter, he says, go tell my disciples and Peter that I'm risen from the dead. So we have Peter's repentance here. And it's funny, when you think about Peter's problem with keeping his eyes on Jesus, 
Peter getting right with God all started the very moment he denied Jesus the last time. Do you remember the passage? We don't have time to go back. But when Peter denied the Lord three times, the last time he denied the Lord, the Lord was being led from Pilate's hall over. And I don't know how close he was, but he was close enough to make eye contact. The Bible says, I think in Luke's gospel, the Lord turned and looked on Peter. The problem we have, keeping our eyes on Jesus, Jesus puts His eyes on us. And He looks at you. It's a discerning look. He knew exactly what Peter did. Peter acknowledges in this passage later, Lord, You know all things. In other words, the Lord's like, didn't I tell you you were going to deny me? He goes, yeah, You know all things. It's a disappointing look. When you see Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ, what look will He give you? I hope it's not a disappointing look. It's a disruptive look. When Jesus looked at Peter, it brought him to his knees. It broke him. Because Peter did love the Lord. He acted out of character. And he got mad. He got his feelings hurt. Jesus rebuked him in front of all those other people. In front of the disciples and in front of Judas and in front of all the, the bad people. Jesus rebuked him in front of all those people. Hurt his feelings. But Peter, when he saw the Lord, as far as he knew, that was the last time he would ever look eyeball to eyeball with Jesus. And it bothered him that his last memory would be a disappointing look by his Savior. So it's amazing here when Jesus appears and He says, come and die. And Peter is one of the first. He jumps out of the boat and he swims to the shore to go see Jesus. And he begins to restore his discipleship. And I think it's interesting in this passage, it's real similar to the very first passage we looked at. When He called them to be disciples... They had a great catch of fish. And he said, you're going to catch men now. I'm going to make you fishers of men. Here, it's like before they get their, their commission, before the great commission is given, there has to be a great commitment. Thank God we have a great commission. But the great commission does no good unless you are greatly committed. And so at this point, he's got Peter and James and John and those other disciples to the very same situation where He called them in the first place. Sometimes the Lord's got to do instant replay with us. Sometimes He has to go back and remind us where He brought us from and remind us what we're to be doing while we're here. Remind us of that original call as He gives us the Great Commission. And He says, you see all those fish? You're supposed to be fishers of men. Jesus knew Peter loved him, but now he says, if you love me, notice in the text, verse 15, you see it, 15, 16, 17. And the reason he says, do you love me three times, has nothing to do with the Greek. So don't buy into that garbage. The Greek, that's inconsistent. We don't have time to even get into that. But agape and phileo are used interchangeably all throughout the Bible. And you can't try to make one of them to be different and try to get some hidden meaning out of the passage. What he's basically saying is, Peter, you denied me three times. I want you to confess me three times. Do you love me? Then he says this, if you love me, how do you prove it? Not just in word. You have to obey him. Feed my sheep. You didn't obey me before. I said, put up the sword. You Chopped the guy's ear off. He says, do you love me more than these? Remember when Peter said, though all men forsake thee, I will not forsake thee. Peter, do you really, really love me more than the other guys? How come they didn't kill anybody? try to kill anybody with the sword? How come you're the one that got away from everybody else? Everybody forsook, but you left the disciples. He asked him some questions, and we'll be done with this. I want you to see the questions. Basically, 
You can see them even in the entire story. In verse number three, when Peter goes fishing, here's a question. Who are you following? Who are you following? Peter says, I'm going fishing and the rest of the guys follow him. Peter was a leader. I believe leaders are born, not made. God has tagged you with leadership. You have a responsibility, especially you fathers and husbands in here. You have a responsibility to lead. Who are you following? The next thing you see in the passage, verse number six, where are you fishing? He says, casting it on the right side of the ship. You know, if you fish on the wrong side, you'll get the wrong results. If you fish on the right side, you'll get the right results. Where are you fishing? You know, you're driving down the road, you try to keep your eyes on the road, right? They have a law in Florida, you know, you can't, or in Georgia and Florida, I think now too, you can't text and drive. They'll give you a ticket. Because the idea is keep your eyes on the road. My question is, can you drive and eat? Because <laughs> sometimes I eat in the car, so I drive with my knees, you know. My knees and... But it's hard to do other things when you're supposed to keep your eyes on the road. And so the idea is, if where are you fishing? Where are you focused at? If you're trying to satisfy your life as a Christian in this world, you're going to come up empty. You were created for His pleasure. Your life is made to glorify God. And some of you are fishing in the world. And you wonder why you're unhappy. You wonder why you're not fulfilled. You wonder why you don't have the fellowship with Jesus that you used to have. It's because you don't have your eyes on Him anymore. you got your eyes on the fishing boat. You know, a lot of people, they, they make overtime, make more money, so then they buy them a boat. They buy them a camper. And then they miss church on Sundays. Because on Saturday and Sunday, they go to the lake. And they go have a good time and spend that money. And they get their eyes off of Jesus Christ. God blesses you with money. Don't spend it on the world. Spend it on the glory of God. Where are you fishing? Then when he asked Peter, do you love me? Who or what do you love more? He says, do you love me more than these? Do you love Jesus Christ more than anybody else? I told the young people, at camp this week, my father got saved the year I was born. He was 30 years of age, and he fell in love with Jesus Christ. He wasn't a preacher, but he was surrendered to God. Great Christian man. I appreciate his life. He died a few years ago. And I am not. I am what I am today because of his influence in my life. I believe that. He led me to Christ. A few years, a couple years after he had gotten saved, he gave my, my mother a Valentine's card. And it said in the card... Next to Jesus, I love you most. In other words, Jesus is first. Jesus before your spouse. Jesus before your children. Jesus before your grandchildren. Jesus before your friends. Jesus before yourself. Jesus before anybody. Who do you love more? Some of you men in here, you're married to your job. You're married to your career. Preachers, sometimes we get married to the church. We get married to the ministry. The church becomes the other wife. Bunch of polygamists. <laughs> we get married to the church. You get caught up in duties. You get caught up in routines and you lose sight of Jesus Christ. The reason we're doing all this, the reason you got to have devil sound systems and pulpits and buildings and light bills and all these things it's for Jesus Christ. Don't lose the reason for all of this. Who or what do you love more? Peter, do you love me? Well, feed my sheep. Then he tells him in verse 18, When you were young, you girdest yourself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. When thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. Peter, you're not going to be able to be selfish anymore. Here's the next question. Are you willing to sacrifice? Are you willing to sacrifice? You see, we move from just the nominal Christian experience to what God intends. God wants us to worship Him. And worship always involves 
sacrifice. What did Abraham say about Isaac? He says, I'm going to go on that mountain, me and the lad. We're going to go yonder and worship. Why? Because they're sacrificed. When the woman broke the alabaster box, it was a year's wages. She busted that and she worshipped because she sacrificed. Are you willing to sacrifice? And when he gives you a task, this is really the last point. When he gives you a task, like he tells Peter here, here's your job. Will you keep your eyes on me? Look what happens at the end of this thing. Verse number 20. Then Peter, turning about and seeing the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which, by the way, was who? That was John. Did everybody know that? That was John, the one who wrote the book of John. He said, he said, verse number 21, Lord, and what shall this man do? Here's the, the last question. Can you keep your eyes off others? Here at the very end of this whole thing, Peter still gets his eyes on somebody else. Some of you, you need to either, some of you just need to get rid of your social media. Let me just go ahead and say it like that. Because some of you, instead of being focused on self or focused on the saints or fo focused on the storm or focused on sinners, some of you are focused on scandals. And you're just, oh, I'm concerned and I want to fellowship. No, you're just a gossip and you want to listen in to what everybody else is doing. You're just interested in what everybody else has got going on. You want to look at their page. You want to look at their pictures because you are nosy and you don't have your eyes on Jesus. You got your eye. Look, I don't have time to get in everybody else's business. I got enough trouble dealing with myself. Man, I don't need all your garbage and all your baggage to go along with it. Some of you must be way more spiritual than I am. I can't handle my own burdens trying to get into everybody else's scandals. By the way, if they're not in church and they're not trying to serve God, what are you doing hanging around them anyway? Even if it is socially on the social media, web, network, whatever it is. I don't care if you don't like it. I know you're not going to quit it. You're going to keep your eyes on the stuff instead of on Jesus. You're going to keep your eyes on the scandal instead of on the Savior. Even at the very end, he says, Peter, who are you looking at? Can you keep your eyes on Jesus? That's the question. Say, preacher, I want my Christian life to be simple. We can simplify it with a real simple procedure. Let's just stay focused on Jesus. Whatever life brings you, whether it be trouble, whether it be a test, whether it be a task, whatever it comes, whether it be a tough place in your life, whatever it brings, just push it aside, stay focused on Him. Push it aside, stay focused on Him. Where's Jesus at? Where's Je I know it's storming. Down in Florida, we have a lot of rain. It rains about here lately, every day, every afternoon it rains. And so we get this stuff called rain -X. I don't know if y'all have it here. You put it on your windshield, you wipe it down, you know, and then you don't even have to use your windshield wiper. It's like wax. It covers your, your windshield. And then when the storm is raining, you see right through it. You just see crystal clear. No matter what life brings, we are to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. That's the key. Wherever you are in life, keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Some of you have gotten your eyes off of Jesus Christ. I'm not saying that you're bad people. I believe, you're, I believe this is the cream of the crop. I believe you're on the front lines. I have the utmost respect for you. You encourage me. But all of us have a tendency to get our eyes off of Jesus. Maybe you've gotten your eyes on the problems of life. Maybe you've gotten your eyes on people. Maybe today, in your heart, with the eye of faith, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wondrous face. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light his glory and grace. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the scripture. Thank you for this church being what they are and being so attentive to the message. I pray that you may help each and every one of us. No matter where we are in life, we all are in different places in our life. Think about the young kids and think about some of the older saints. We're all at a different place. And it's so easy to get our eyes on all these other things. Lord, help us to stay focused on Jesus Christ. I pray maybe today someone here would turn their eyes upon Jesus. If someone here is not saved, 
They need to turn their eyes on Jesus Christ before it's too late and they lift up their eyes in hell. I pray, God, that you'd help us as believers to keep focused on Jesus Christ. I ask that you might help us and show us where we have gotten out of focus. In Jesus' name I pray.